E aí, gente? Bebrura aqui! Hoje, gente conversar sobre a deixando a morte ficar no mosto para a noite inteira. Mas primeiro, thank you for all of my uh, returning viewers and subscribers. I really appreciate the support. Today, we're going to be discussing uh, allowing the mash to, to stand overnight and to allow the, the malt to stay mashing overnight. So one of the reasons why uh, we would want to do this is to lower the te temperature where we allow the, the malt to sacrify or, or allow the starches to be broken down. Now, when we use the mash at 150 degrees, that's because that's the most efficient uh, temperature range for both the beta amylase and the alpha amylase. So it generally only takes about an hour to break down all of the uh, starches into simple sugars, but you can also have a protein rest. Now the protein rest is when some enzymes work against the beta glucans to break them up into uh, other edible sources and uh, also flocculate down to the end and, uh, or to the bottom during uh, fermentation so that you end up with uh, less cloudy beer. Now, uh, one of the problems with uh, enzymes is once you go over temperature range, they start to denature and they are no longer useful. So what I tried to do was allow about 130 degrees for this overnight mash, which would allow for those uh, beta glucans to be broken down as well as uh, activate the beta amylase. Although it wouldn't be very efficient, it was going to sit for uh, at least eight hours, but I think it actually sat for 11 hours. Curious enough, and uh, unfortunately, the uh, first freeze of uh, the winter was also that night. So when I came out, the uh, mash was actually standing at 80 degrees after I had set it up at uh, 130. It should have still stayed over 100 degrees for at least three to four hours, which should have been plenty of time for the beta amylase to, to work on those starches. Uh, so I'm curious as to what happened here. So uh, first we're gonna look at the control. Now this did end up a little bit flat. I had a problem with priming, but it does smell like I expect it to. It's a little bit of sweetness on that, although um, that is the control, so I know it's uh, all broken down. So this one should be a little bit on the sweet side too, but Aroma is a little more pronounced as we would expect since there is a little bit more carbonation here. There's maybe a little bit more sweetness and actually a little bit more mouthfeel, which I'm surprised about since uh, we're going to be breaking down more of those proteins. Now the clarity on uh, this guy is a little bit uh, uh, also problematic. You can't really judge the clarity on this because I allowed this to ferment under pressure and I didn't alter the size of my dip tube. So this was not a keg that I generally ferment under pressure. And uh, so I actually grabbed a little bit of that uh, sediment from the bottom, which could also be affecting the mouthfeel. But the flavor is the same. So I am excited about the uh, experiment. I'm gonna try it again. Uh, this time I'm going to make sure that it doesn't freeze or I'm going to leave it inside so that it isn't affected by the temperature so much. But there, uh, there we go is the conclusion for this experiment. Now there is a uh, update from the uh, fermenting under pressure. I had been fermenting under pressure at 15 psi and uh, when I dispensed the keg I was able to dispense the entirety of the keg without adding any additional gas to push. Now it did come out a little bit foamy, so I'm gonna back it out just a little bit, but it is an interesting experiment that uh, allows me to go ahead and save some money also on the uh, carp CO2 pushing out the, uh, the beer. So that's also pretty exciting.